draft is done. Free agency is done. They have a new head coach. What is next on Don Waddell's to-do list? Well, there's some RFAs that really need new contracts. So we're going to talk about that on today's Locked on Blue Jackets. Your Locked on Blue Jackets, your daily podcast on the Columbus Blue Jackets, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Blue Jackets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am, as always, your host Jay Foster, here to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly about your favorite team and mine, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone for making this your first listen of the day every single day. Locked On Blue Jackets continues to be free and available on all podcast platforms and over on YouTube. I also have to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. There's something for everyone every single day, all summer long. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. And uh, we're going to get started here with uh, some chat about Don Waddell and what he still has to do this summer. Um Across another big item off his to-do list on Monday afternoon uh, by by announcing a new head coach. They've done the draft. They've done free agency. Uh, they've signed some of their RFAs to new contracts. But arguably, the big boys are still unsigned. Um, I, had, I did not think that Marchenko was going to be one of the last contracts that needed signing. Um, if I'm if I'm being very honest, uh, he would have been my number one priority. Um, but sometimes things take a little bit longer. Um, so I want to talk about him. Whether he's going to hit arbitration. Um, he made he had an interview with a uh, KHL reporter or a, a Russian reporter at the KHL NHL All Star Charity Game that he played at the weekend. Um, so we're going to touch on that a little bit, and then. Um, Yesterday it came out that we're likely looking at a multi-year contract for Cole Sillinger and a one-year contract for Kent Johnson. So we're going to talk about, is that the right choice? Um, what kind of numbers could we see? Things like that. So uh, let's start with Marchenko because he is arguably the most important of, of the three. Um, I, he had the best season last year. Um, he's older um and uh most importantly he's eligible for arbitration which he did file for arbitration um that doesn't mean they're going to get there um his hearing is set for i believe a week today so they've got you know they've got some time to get it done um i am a little surprised that they didn't get it done already but here we are um i wanted to touch on the the comments that were made to that reporter um a little, a little while ago, I believe it was at the weekend. Um, they had a an All Star game for uh, NHL star Russian NHL stars versus um, KHL All Stars, and Marchenko was there. He played, and uh, they basically uh, he he had a conversation with a a Russian reporter there and um they talked about uh basically he hasn't um he hasn't talked to Waddell which everyone was really confused about but players don't typically talk to the GM in this negotiation it's the agent in this case Dan Milstein who represents a lot of the Russian talent in the NHL um and they also said that they haven't had any worthy offers from Columbus. This is also unsurprising because they, if they had had a worthy offer, then uh, they wouldn't. He would be signed. They would have signed the contract already. So it was a lot of. I hesitate to say like buzzwords, um, but there was a lot of conversation about um, like, oh, this is this is bad, but this is terrible. This is the worst thing, um, and like it's not the worst thing in the world uh it's kind of unexpected not unexpected um but he basically just he doesn't want to go to arbitration the team doesn't want to go to arbitration like it's in both of their best interests to 
figure this out over the next week. And now that everything else on, or almost everything else on Don Waddell's to-do list has kind of been wrapped up, he can really turn his focus to signing Marchenko, and then after that, he can turn his focus to Sillinger and Ken Johnson, um, who we'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, Marchenko is due for probably the biggest pay raise of all of the uh, all of the RFAs. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, to Puckpedia to take a quick peek at uh, the the cap uh, situation and the new contract and everything. Um, but yeah, like Chinikov resigned 2.1 million. Um, they didn't get rid. They got rid of uh, Bean. They didn't sign Nylander. Um, uh, Texier traded. Uh, the other, the other um, RFAs that are now signed. Jay Christensen signed a uh, one-year, two-way, one-year, one-way deal. Uh, Seven seventy-five um, takes him to being a UFA, I believe, uh, or potentially depending on how many um, how many NHL games he's played by the end of this contract, I believe. Um, and then Jack Greaves also signed. He signed a two-year um, contract, two-way the first year, one-way the second year, um, but he's only making 812 and a half thousand only. But Gromachenko is likely going to get somewhere in the realm of between five and six million, is my guess, for somewhere between four and six years. Um, honestly, if they can get him for, and I've talked about this on the show before, if they can get him for like five by five, um, that feels great to me. That might be a little pricey right now for a guy that has a career high of 25 goals, but if he continues to develop and improve the way that like his trajectory is going, that's going to be a steal by year two, year three of that contract. Um, and I think there's something to be said for locking up one of your young stars semi long term, as opposed to um, just going from bridge deal to bridge deal to bridge deal before they walk in UFA, you know, which is um, we've seen happen with with players before. Um, I I am not sure what the specific holdup is in terms of like what whether he wants more money or more term and the team would rather do maybe more money for a shorter term um, or, or what's going on. Like, is he fishing for an eight year deal? Maybe. Um, but I haven't heard any kind of specifics like that, but I am kind of a little bit like, I don't think they should sign it, like hand him a blank check necessarily, but the team is in a decent enough position with the cap um, that I don't think it makes sense to argue about like a million here or there um, or an extra year here or there, especially for a young, talented player like um, like Marchenko. Um, they've got 70, over $17 million in cap space currently to re-sign Marchenko, Selinger, and Johnson. Um, and that's not, that's, that's with Patrick Lyonet's contract counting against the books as well. So like... If they shift Lionel, there's an extra eight million there, nearly nine million. If they manage to shift him as for as much as fifty percent retained, that's still almost four and a half million dollars to add to that. So they'll be over twenty million dollars in uh, in cap space, and that's even with giving Sean Monahan like five and a half million dollars. So like obviously some of that money has to be earmarked for like the next couple of years. Um, Frogkov is an RFA after next year. Um, the year after that, Fantilli and Brindley are up. Um, who else is uh, is is do a new contract? Um, no one like life changing is uh, is do a new contract. Uh, Jake Christensen would need a new contract next year. Um, potentially Kent Johnson, which again we'll talk about in a minute. But like I'm not worried about the cap space here, and I don't think they are particularly cap crunched. So if it was me, I might be willing to overpay Marchenko, or n- not necessarily overpay, but pay a little bit more than what the team perceives his value to be to get him signed long-term because I believe, and I could be wrong with this, but if he hits arbitration, um, they have to sign the player to the contract that is 
given. So they might go in, they might go into the arbitration hearing and come out and it'll be like, right, okay, one year, seven million or something, which is it's not gonna happen, but it might be something like that. And then they do this all again next year. Um, so I would be inclined to maybe overpay a little bit. Again, air quotes on uh, on overpay. Um, you can't see because my hands are below the screen, but I am doing air quotes um, to see, basically just to get that ticked off and then you don't have to worry about Marchenko for the next four, five, six years. Um, it's maybe not like a great way to GM and maybe that's why I'm not a GM, but uh, I feel like locking up the player long-term is more important than going to arbitration and then potentially um, not ruining that player's relationship with a team. But I think it definitely affected um, the big one. I think is Jeremy Swayman, who a lot of people talk about, and have uh, he talked he's talked about how much he hated arbitration because it was going into a room and he had a bunch of people telling him why he didn't deserve the amount of money that he was asking for, and um, it sucked. Like if I if I had to go into a room and with all with like my boss and my boss's boss and um, like the CEO of the company and everyone and then had to listen to them sit there and give me a bunch of reasons why I'm bad at my job and why I shouldn't be getting paid, um, like that would suck. So it's in everyone's best interest to avoid arbitration. I just don't know if they can do it. Blue Jackets have never had a player go to arbitration, for what it's worth. Um, and like I said, <clears throat> like I said, Waddell's to do list is basically just. Much Echo Sillinger, Ken Johnson at this point. There's some other things like assistant coaches, and um, I'm sure he wants to make some other hires kind of in the uh, in the analytics side of things or in the front office side of things. Like there's some little things, but this is the most important thing to do right now. So my guess is now that Everson is hired, now that the press conference for that is done, like this is what Waddell is going to be doing um, basically until it's done. Because I don't think they want to hit arbitration. Machenko doesn't want to hit arbitration. He doesn't want to fly out to Toronto in the middle of his summer vacation to, again, sit in a room and be told why he's not good enough to be paid the amount of money that he thinks he's worth. So um, I still think it'll get sorted. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if something happens. Again, because this is the nature of how this podcast works. If something happens later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, but Machenko will get signed. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Cole Sillinger and Kent Johnson, their new contracts, what I think about that, uh, or their new potential contracts, I should say. No, none of, neither of them have signed anything yet, but uh, we'll talk about that in just a second here on Lockdown Blue Jackets. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But playoffs have wound down. Uh, the... Basketball has stopped. Uh, the Olympics is going, but we're getting fewer games and we're getting no hockey games at all. The sports aren't sportsing like I want them to, but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And you can do that as well. And here's the best bit. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus every single day. That's right. There is something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. Bet on the Reds. Bet on the Guardians. Bet on the Olympics. Bet on, I don't know, NASCAR, golf. They've got all kinds of stuff at FanDuel. So uh, once again, FanDuel.com. And uh, they're the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and also us, the Locked On Podcast network welcome back to locked on blue jackets uh we're talking about rfas today uh does much anger hit arbitration i think no but we'll see what happens uh i want to talk a little bit about the other two rfas that are kind of left in the organization and that's cole Sillinger and kent johnson who are arguably um these feel arguably more important than Marchenko's contract in a different way because these are potentially two building blocks of the future. I'm not saying that Marchenko isn't, but this is a fifth overall pick and a twelfth overall pick. Um, they're both still really young. Uh, I don't think either of them has turned 21 yet. Uh, that might be a lie. I think both of them might have just turned 21, but still very, very young. Um, yeah, Cole Sillinger turned 21 in May, and Kent Johnson is, uh, oh, he turned 21 all the way back in October. He's, he's, uh, one of the older, uh, one of the older of his draft class, but, 
My point still stands. They're 21 years old. They are yo- they are so young. Marchenko, I think, is 23 or 24. So, like, while still young, while still part of that core, we're not looking to get Marchenko for the next, like, 15-plus years. I think the Blue Jackets are trying to keep Sillinger and Kent Johnson for the next 15-plus years. Um, that being said... They're approaching these two contracts in very different ways, which I understand. Uh, And it's something that I kind of predicted a little bit when we were talking about, okay, who's getting what? Who's getting, you know, Marchenko long-term, Chinakov bridge deal. uh, And I I said, Ken Johnson, probably a bridge deal. Sillinger, I wouldn't be surprised if they go a little bit longer term. Um, And uh, it came out, uh, I believe, yesterday afternoon-ish, uh, that Sillinger is likely getting a multi-year contract. Kent Johnson is uh, getting a one-year contract. And these both make a, a lot of sense to me. So we'll we'll start with Sillinger first. Um, my guess is that they're not going to sign Cole Sillinger to the, like, Tim Stutz, like Jack Hughes contract. My guess is he gets three years at around about three million. Uh, he's... Coming off his, uh, he's coming off his entry level uh, contract. He had a solid rookie season, a not great sophomore season, and then last season was uh, was really quite good again. Uh, had thirty two points in seventy seven games, playing primarily on the fourth on the third line, um, getting only uh, thirteen and a half minutes uh, a game, and. Uh, Played, especially at the end of the season there, played some heavy minutes against some of the big boys in the league. You know, like he, he matched up against Nate McKinnon. Uh, he matched up against Conor McDavid. He matched up against Sidney Crosby. Like he he did a lot of heavy lifting late in the season. I think they view him kind of as that next Boone Jenner, um, kind of Swiss Army knife type player of, will probably play lower down in the lineup, but can be kind of a, a force if you deploy him properly. Um so while I don't think it's necessarily going to be like a um, an eight year contract for Sillinger, my guess is somewhere again, and I'm I'm really ballparking this. It might be a little bit higher, a little bit low, um, somewhere in the realm of three to four million for three to four years. Um, I think I tweeted yesterday that my guess is three point three by three for for Sillinger. I would be more than okay with that. Um, I would be more. I would be okay with. Um, I'd be okay with uh, four million for three years. I would be okay with like uh, three million for two years. Like a shorter with slightly more term, I would be fine with. Um, he's still a while away from being a um, a UFA. Uh, I'm trying to find. Uh, he'll be a UFA in the 2028 season. So if he gets a um, a three year contract. That will, I believe, walk him right up to the year. Okay, so here we go. Here's the thing. A three-year contract will walk him right up to, he will have one season left as an RFA, and then he will become UFA. So, highly unlikely that Sillinger is getting a um, a four-year contract. It is either going to be three or potentially five. Um, I don't think it'll be five. That feels too long. Um for Sillinger as it stands right now. So my guess is three years, they walk him right up to before free agency uh, or being a UFA and then sign him either longer term then or, you know, we'll see what kind of player he is in in three seasons time uh, when he's, you know, 24 and has been in this league for six seasons already, which feels insane to have six seasons under your belt by the age of 24. But beside the point, um, I'm I'm more than okay with this kind of structuring of a deal for Selinger. Um, I think it's it's the smart thing to do. I think again, it would be easy to be like, right, okay, you can have one year at, at four million, and then we'll we'll go back to the book. We'll go back and we'll we'll figure it out next season. Like it's just kicking the can down the road. Um, but I equally don't think that you want to give them, you know, five, six, seven years because we've kind of seen what what happens there with um you know someone like uh Elvis Mosleykins for example who got um a five year contract after i think after after his second year in in the league um and you know I'm you know I'm a big defender of Elvis but that contract has not panned out how we thought it would 
So I, uh, you know, different GM, different situation. Uh, but my guess is Woodell is not eager to hand out a ton of long-term contracts or like super long-term contracts. My guess is he's also not super confident in handing out a bunch of one-year deals and then having to do all of this again next year, but with the added, um, like, uh, Daniel Tarasov needs a new contract next year. He was one that I missed earlier. Dmitry Vronkov will need a new contract. Um, Trefik Polanski needs a new contract next season. You know, all of these... Um, all of these guys that should protect, should be part of the organization for at least a little bit longer. And then if you have to add Sillinger, Johnson, Marchenko, um, whoever on top of that, like that's just more work to do next summer. So I can see why he wants to avoid something like that. Um, so that's why, yeah, Sillinger getting a longer term deal makes a ton of sense. I think it'll be two or three years. My guess is three years. My guess is around three, maybe three and a half million. And I am perfectly okay with that. Um, I am just looking up the um, the contract predictor for the uh, NHL because it's real fun and uh, easy to use. Uh, you just have to control alt uh, and uh, they have his projected cap hit at two years for uh, 2.2 million. So again, three years, three million feels about right. Um, again, I don't know exactly how they, uh, how they calculate, um, any of that, but, uh, they don't actually have Kent Johnson, uh, they don't have a, uh, um, a prediction for, for Kent Johnson. So that's not helpful to me, but we'll take another quick break. Then when we get back, we'll talk a little bit about Kent Johnson, um, and why I think that in this case, a one-year deal is ideal for specifically the player. So we'll do that in just a second here on Locked on Blue Jackets. Welcome back to Locked on Blue Jackets. We are talking all about RFAs today. We've talked about Marchenko. We've talked about Sillinger. Now we're going to talk about Kent Johnson, uh, who is likely getting a one-year deal. Um, I'm more than okay with this. I think uh, Kent Johnson had... Uh, it didn't have the year that anyone was really expecting, and I don't know that much of it was his fault. Um, he clearly was on the outs with the coach very early on, spent some time in the AHL, was injured for the back part of the season. Um, I don't remember when exactly he got injured. It was near the end-ish of the season, but still, like, he'd kind of picked himself back up and was performing, and then he gets injured, and it really put an end to a season, which sucked. Um Sophomore slumps happen. You know, players come into the league the first year and they go hell for leather. And then the second year, they have to figure out how to either maintain that or even do better. Um, and Johnson struggled, I think. Inconsistent line mate, inconsistent ice time, inconsistent coaching, getting sent down, getting healthy scratched. You know, there was all of these rumors flying around about how unhappy he was in Columbus and how he wanted to trade and blah, blah, blah. Um, but... I, I think a a one-year deal here is perfect um, because it gives the player a chance to bet on himself. And I think the team is wanting, I think the team wants to bet on Johnson as well. And I think, um, again, this is potentially a, a piece of the core for the next 10 to 15 years for this team, you know? Um, and I know that everyone has Kent Johnson penciled in as as immediately getting traded as soon as there's any kind of indication that that a trade is happening. Um, I saw someone suggesting that we should trade Line A with Kent Johnson and David Yerichek for um, Nikolai Ehlers and Neil Pionk on on Twitter the other day, which is a hilarious trade that I enjoy uh, laughing at quite a bit. So uh, obviously that's not happening, but people love to trade Kent Johnson. People who aren't Blue Jackets fans love to trade Ken Johnson. Anyway, um, giving him like a one by two million uh, contract gives him a little bit of a raise uh, and, and gives him a chance to come back fully healthy, new coach, new systems, uh, hopefully more consistent lifetime, time, more consistent line mates, and uh, to really kind of do the best he can to show the team that he is worth a longer term deal. Um, 
And I, again, I am I am more than okay with that. Would I like to see Ken Johnson signed long term to again kind of take away having to do this whole song and dance again next season? Sure, but uh, it's not the end of the world. And like again, I think this is the best thing for both team and player. Um, especially, I think if the, if the players if if the player who his agent is Pat Brisson now, by the way, he switched agents mid season last year, so I know everyone panicked about that as well. But it's that's just who represents all of the boys from Michigan because they all know Brandon Brisson, who is his son. So it's not nepotism, but it's almost nepotism. Um, that being said, I'm I'm also not worried. Like a lot of people are worrying about how people aren't signed yet, and there's a lot of of stress about why Caden Lindstrom hasn't been signed to his ELC yet. Uh, but I'm not worried about any of these uh, signings. Um, yeah, Ken Johnson, again, coming off his ELC uh, and his qualifying offer. So, it, like, the worst thing that happens here is he signs he signs his qualifying offer, which is um, 874000 um for one year. And, again, they, they kick the can down the road. My guess is they probably negotiate something um, – a little bit higher than that, 1.5, maybe 2 million. Like, 2 million feels right at the right at the upper limit. But again, they have a little bit of cap space to play with this year, and it's a little bit of like, a, okay, we'll reward you. Now go reward us with a really great season, and then we'll talk again next summer. Um, I would really love for um, Ken Johnson to come out of the come out of the gate real hot. Um, it's going to be tough because obviously he spent all of the summer rehabbing the shoulder instead of training, but he's a year older. He's going to keep getting stronger. I know that he struggles to keep weight on and that's the injury isn't going to have helped it that in any way. But, um, if he spent the summer like rehabbing his shoulder, but really working on like his skating and his footwork and stuff like that's his kind of not his weakness, but if his feet can catch up to his hands like he'll be an incredible player so I'm really I'm really interested to see what Ken Johnson looks like this upcoming season again different coach different systems probably different line mates he didn't have the best line mates for for chunks of the season and uh yeah give him a one-year show me contract and then next season we'll do this again but we'll be saying yeah no give Ken Johnson five years at five million or whatever um and I again will be more than okay with that if he has the season that I think a lot of people are betting on him to have this year. Um, so it's a short to-do list for Dobbledell, but it's kind of an important one. Um, obviously, I mentioned at the end that Caden Lindstrom needs an ALC. I imagine that'll happen at some point. I'm not worried about that. Someone was saying that that was a, a, a sign of, of Don Waddell not being good at his job, is that he should just hurry up and get the kid signed and, you know, start the process. But It'll happen when it happens, you know. Again, he's been a busy guy for the first what two months of has it even been two months yet for the like first six weeks of his tenure in Columbus. Like it's on his to do list. Let's get all of these sorted, and I would guess that Lindstrom's uh, ELC will probably happen maybe sometime around. If it hasn't happened by the start of training camp, I'll be surprised. But my guess is it'll happen sometime between now and then. Um, so. Not worried, basically, is the summary of this episode is I'm not worried about anything that's happening right now. If Machen if we're still having this conversation about Machenko on, like, let's say, Monday or Tuesday, uh, then maybe I might start getting a little bit worried. But he's got a week to knuckle down and start working with uh, Dan Milstein on a new contract. I think it'll get done before the end of this week. Um, I'm big optimistic. Someone accused me of being um, negative and depressing on uh, on an episode earlier this week. So this is me being optimistic and hopefully that person has come back and seen that I am actually capable of being excited about this team and saying nice things. So we'll see. Um, that's all I've got for today though. Uh, tomorrow, I think we'll do a little bit more prospect chat. I think I've got one more segment of uh, Sebastian High uh, from Lockdown and Agile Prospect talking about which prospect he expects to have uh, big seasons this year, either at, like rookie season with Columbus or seasons back in juniors or college or whatever. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, on, on tomorrow's episode. 
Uh, I've been Jay Foster. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Jacob Foster, J-A-K-O-B-F-O-R-S-T-E-R. You can find the show at L-O underscore Blue Jackets. Uh, if you have comments, questions, criticisms, you can email me at lockedonbluejackets at gmail.com. Uh, thank you for listening, for making us your first listen of the day every single day. Locked on Blue Jackets is free and available on all podcast platforms over on YouTube and on Sirius X. Um, once again, prospect talk tomorrow. But until then, make sure you stay locked on.